Hi, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the third and final Weed Inspector and Land Manager webinar in our 2022 uh, winter series. My name is Joanne Kwasniewski and I'm the Plant Health Officer for SARM Division 2. Today's webinar will be recorded and posted on the SARM website and there is one continuing education credit available for pesticide applicators. After the webinar, a short survey will pop up in your browser and we would really appreciate your feedback so that we can continue to curate and improve these webinars for you. Today's webinar is gonna be about invasive plant biocontrol, how it works and prospects for Saskatchewan. And it is going to be presented by Rose de Clerc Float. After Rose finish, finishes her presentation, I will pop on briefly to go over our current biocontrol program in Saskatchewan. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Rose has been studying the use of foreign insects in the biological control of invasive plants for 30 years in her position as a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lethbridge. She is an import to Western Canada, having grown up in a small town in Northern Ontario, where she began developing her interests in entomology and botany. This led her to obtaining a Master's of Science in Biology at the University of Saskatchewan and a PhD in Botany from Northern Arizona University. Now she is mentoring the next generation of biological control researchers while working on the next bunch of invasive plants of concern to Canadian agriculture, such as oxeye daisy and common tansy. And with that, I'll hand things over to Rose. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you, Joanna. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is Rose, and I, um, I'm really happy, uh, was happy to be invited to speak to you because um, we have uh, in the past had a number of uh, weed biocontrol projects in Saskatchewan. Uh, that's where uh, Peter Harris, who, who started who was really like the grandfather of uh, weed bar control in Canada was situated in Regina for many years. And uh, there were other researchers there as well, uh, like Dieter Peshkin uh, with a Canada and, and Regina. But, um, but anyway, I, like I'm looking forward to get, getting you some more insects too. So I'm going to, first of all, uh, yeah, give an overview of what our fire control program is all about. Uh, a bit, you know, a bit on the history, and um, and and during that process, I, I'll talk about a just a couple of past successes that are relevant to Saskatchewan, uh, and uh, but then also a number of new and promising agents that we're currently working on, um, and uh, at the very end, I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, an important process or part of our research is actually not only developing and getting these new agents uh, released in Canada, but developing methods of using them and getting them into the hands of st stakeholders as soon as possible with information on how, how to uh, make releases and, and uh, get them working for, for you in cases where you really need, uh, need to control these invasive plants. Um, I'd like to uh, yeah, bring people back to what uh, classical weed biological control is all about. Like it's, that's uh, the term um, that's used or to describe our, our science. And it's uh, classical because it's what, you know, it, bringing uh, foreign agents in is, a, is the classical method of, of uh, practicing biological control. And, but it, uh, it, it's all ba it's based on the fact that you're going back to the home range or the home country uh, or area where, the, where these invasive plants come from to find the natural enemies that feed on them and develop on them, whether those are insects or pathogens. And, uh, and the whole intent is not to eradicate the weed, but to bring its populations down using these organisms down to below damage, damaging levels. Uh, these are levels that are, uh, that are damaging either from an economic perspective or also environmental. 
but um yeah but that's the key is that it's a tool in the toolbox for weed management or invasive plant ma management and uh it can be in you know, we need to look more at an integrated approach, I think, uh, looking at how to use other methods of control, such as uh, herbicides or cultural methods of control in conjunction with weed biocontrol. But there are many benefits of, of using this method. And in some cases, it fits in into areas that where it's difficult or impossible to use other methods of control, um, you know, such as natural areas close to water that can't be, where the weeds can't be sprayed uh, with herbicides. And, uh, but the important thing though, is that it's, uh, it's very, it's meant to be very host specific. You're targeting uh, a specific weed and, and, and we do our best in, in the thorough testing that goes on before we petition for release of these agents in Canada to make sure that we understand what the host range is of these insects and what the potential risks may be. Um, but once they get established, um, they can be self-propagating and dispersing and they can be very successful. I'm going to give a couple examples of that. But, uh, but importantly, they can pr provide long-term control without additional input. Like unlike uh, when you spray herbicides, for instance, in the control of an invasive plant, uh, it, it takes a number of years to, to achieve control often. Um, but the whole idea with biocontrol is that it's, it's self-running and uh, it's because of that long-term control that it can be very cost-effective if you don't have to reapply the agents in this case, um, you can have a cost to benefit ratio. Uh, in this case, this is from Australia, every dollar spent, uh, you get $23 saved or back. Um, I've seen ratios as high as a one to a hundred or more, but that's all based on, it depends on the, the weed and the insect system involved and uh, how long a, pro a program has uh, has been running, like how, how long term is this control. And as I mentioned, you know, the biocontrol is often the only option for mitigation of invasive plants in natural areas. Our program has been quite long running. Uh, you know, I've come in uh, after a string of people or researchers that have uh, all work for Agriculture Canada, um, starting in 1951. So that's uh, over 70 years ago that our program began. And since that time, 86 species of uh, biocontrol agents, most of those being insects, have been released against 34 targeted invasive plant species. Now, uh, the reason why the number of plant species is lower than the number of agents brought in is that some of these species have several different species of, or some of the plants have several different species of agents that have been released just to target the one plant, uh, plant species. But uh, of those that have been released over time, 68% uh, have established in Canada. So these uh, insects or arthropods are, or organisms are um, are now part of the uh, the fauna of the native fauna of our you know, of our country, um, and even though they they're foreign, but they they just uh, the whole idea is that they kind of slip slip into our our uh, our ecosystems and behave themselves too. Um, but of those that have established, uh, approximately forty six percent of these established agents uh, have had some level of impact on their weed. Now, yeah, going back to what I mentioned initially, uh, the, the intent is not to eradicate or kill all, the whole, all of the populations and plants in the populations of these weeds, because you want to have, in the end, you want to bring the populations of the invasive plant below a, a, you know, a non-damaging level, 
uh, but you want to keep a few of those plants in the environment so that the insect that you released or the biocontrol agent you released also remains in the environment in case that uh, weed should take off in number again, start increasing in number. The, the insect is, is there and, and available and waiting and its numbers will go up as well. Uh, that's the whole intent of, of weed, bi weed biological control. There, of the types of agents that have established, um, yeah, there, uh, there's a, yeah, there's a broad range, but um, if you were to group them into, you know, like with the insects especially, uh, into you know, various uh, categories. Uh, the bulk of those that have established well are the beetles and weevils, uh, which have the long noses. Um, they're a type of beetle. So uh, yeah, the majority have been beetles, which have been quite successful. But then uh, we also have a portion that are Lepidoptera. Those are all moth species that have been released and have established and also flies. Uh, that are plant feeding. There's a small number of wasps that don't sting people, but they um, they, they feed on plants, and they and they can be quite effective. And uh, then there's bugs. These are true bugs that uh, suck the <clears throat> suck the sap of of the plants, um, and we and weaken the plant thereby, um, maybe also reducing the reproduction of the plant. And then my, and mites, which are arachnids, but these are plant feeding mites, and I'll introduce a couple of those in a bit. But uh, I think the beetles are, are stars. They um, are top 10 agents in terms of impact are have been beetles. And uh, I'll be introducing a number of those when I talk about successes. Um, but they're also generally easy to rear and uh, they survive handling well. Uh, for instance, you know, just even getting them shipped and uh, and uh, driven out to remote sites and released, um, they they're hardy. They're a lot hardier than some of the other uh, insects we work with. This is a, li a full list of all the different um, of uh, different invasive plants that have been targeted since 1951 in Canada. The the list to the um, to the left are the older targets. Uh, the, you know, St. John's wort was the very first weed targeted for biocontrol in BC, and that, that was in 1951. Um, and uh, you know, a number of these uh, aren't totally controlled. And you know, and when the environment changes too, sometimes these can re, uh, reemerge as as uh, yeah, as serious weeds too. So like field bindweed, for instance, there's been a few agents released on it at the very beginning, like I uh, think in the uh, 1970s and 80s, but they're not working too well. So we've we've gone back to Europe to find some new agents uh, and they're being tested now for, bar, uh, for their efficacy and, and safety as well. Uh, and what, you know, it's basically what they feed on. Um, but, and then also too, like we're going back to look at the, some of the first uh, uh, weeds, like for, uh, to the right, at the very top, diffuse and spawn and knapweed. There's been definitely some success on diffuse knapweed of uh, the agents have been released against it, but um, spotted uh, has been more difficult to control. And so we've uh, recently, there's been a hiring uh, and positioning of a couple of new, uh, scientists at our Summerland Research Center, Research and Development Center, and that they've been um, hired to to look at some of these older projects in British Columbia to see what can be done to um, to increase uh, you know, the, the likelihood of control using biological control. Towards the bottom of this list, there's a like from uh, like Japanese knotweed down. These are all new targets for us. And uh, my um, colleague, Rob Boucher, who's the other scientist that's here at Lethbridge working on we biological control full time, um, we, we've kind of divided these new weeds. So I'm not going to be talking about Rob's weeds. And uh, like he's, he's working on Japanese knotweed. Um, 
and also on dog strangling vine, common reed, and garlic mustard. But I'll be talking about the projects that are ongoing right now in, in our lab. So you're all familiar probably with uh, with the leafy spurge beetles, the Aphthona beetles, uh, that feed on the roots of, uh, of leafy spurge. And uh, yeah, of course, leafy spurge is still, well, of course, it's still a problem in places, uh, but these beetles have been really uh, helpful in, in gaining some control over, over the weed. And of course, it depends on, um, on the environment, uh, the location, where the weed is growing and the species of uh, beetle, because there's been several species of these flea beetles released against spurge. But, um, but we consider it as, as an example of a success in that it has uh, re reduced populations of the weed. And it'd be far worse today if we didn't have these beetles present. But I'm going to get, tell you about um, a project I was involved with at you know, the beginning of my career. And, um, and it's an amazing project. And actually, Saskatchewan got its first release of this, uh, of this biocontrol agent, which is a weevil. And it's larvae feed in the roots of hound's tongue. And hound's tongue is a toxic weed. And it produce, produces these barbed nut nutlets uh, or fruits that attach to yeah, the, the, the fur of animals, including cattle. And that's how it, it hitch, hitch hikes around uh, and moves to new locations. But uh, these dense patches uh, occur, this was in, in British Columbia, you do, not, you do not see these dense patches anymore since the agent was first released in 1997. Um, but, uh, I guess there's been an outbreak of Hanstein in the Quipel Valley. So, so it, this uh, I got word of it and, and I was asked to, to send some weevils to Saskatchewan for release in 2020. And then that, that year, <laughs> uh, we, weren't, um, we weren't traveling because of COVID. And, and, uh, but luckily we have some, um, some in our river valley on Hanstein in basically my backyard so I collected some up with my technician and we shipped them out and I don't know if they established but my guess is that they have uh, this agent like a hundred percent of the time it establishes and uh, yeah I don't know of any failures and it, um, it's very good at, uh, it has been very successful at controlling its weed I knew that we had a uh, success successful agent when i went out um even the year after this is the sort of thing i was seeing um uh, here's a, at the top is this uh, really sick hound's tongue rosette normally they look like this one at the bottom the, the lush green leaves of an un, unattacked uh, uh, hound's tongue plant is showing and um so then within you know a couple of years two to three years, we started seeing uh, this crash in the populations of, of hound's tongue. These dense patches um, you know, went down to just a few plants with, uh, with the, the weevil off looking for the next patch of hound's tongue. They're very good at seeking out uh, its weed and uh, finding it and, and then starting the whole process over again. So they're behaving like a classical uh, we biological control agent the way you want it to, uh, to behave. So now I'm going to move on and talking about the whole process uh, that we go through in, um, yeah, in developing biocontrol. Uh, there's several steps. Uh, we've broke it down into seven steps. Uh, it looks complicated, but uh, I'm going to be focusing at the begin on the beginning to just give you an idea of the, the level of research that goes into getting an agent into the hands of people that need them. Um, but it, it can take many years. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it can even take decades to, to get through a program. And, um, but it all begins with, with uh, we have a group in Switzerland. Uh, of, it's a not-for-profit called CABI. 
and the, uh, the entomologists there, they go out uh, looking for potential agents that are host specific based on the literature in Europe, usually, um, and also in Asia, like some of our agents are coming from Asia now. Um, but they, they uh, distill uh, or break it down into a short list of uh, potential agents that they test very thoroughly. It takes, that can take many years. And these are risk assessment studies to test for uh, you know, the safety of re releasing the agent. So it won't feed on anything you don't want, want it to feed on or damage um, anything you don't want damaged in terms of other vegetation. And that's whether these plants are uh, native or are of economic importance to Canada. The petition, uh, which is a hefty document, inc includes all the test results uh from these uh yeah these risk assessments and uh but also whatever is known about the biology of the insect and and the, the host weed as well but that gets reviewed scientifically when it's sent to cfia is a regulatory agency that's involved with this and uh and then they say either yes or no uh, under recommendation from, from the experts, the, the scientists that review these petitions. They say yes or no to whether, wh whether or not to release the agent in our environment. Uh, now, going hand in hand with this whole process of, uh, of doing the host specificity testing is rearing uh, for these studies and also rearing for potential future releases if the agent's approved for release. Once it's approved, you go to initial field releases. Those are experimental. You're trying to figure out where the insect does best out in, into, you know, into the new environment in Canada, in this case. And uh, so then we, that's where we come in as well with, a, with our research is figuring out where the insect is establishing well and what kind of impact is it having on the weed? Is it behaving itself as well? and not feeding on other things that uh, we predicted that they may, may feed on, if it, especially if the plants are closely related to the weed involved. And then, um, then once all's well, uh, and you know you have a winning insect, that's when you go into uh, researching release strategies so that you have, um, you have some, information to hand to the stakeholders that will be using the agent and then also developing math, methods of mass rearing the agent ready for more general distribution by people. At the very end you can look at the long-term interactions between the insect and uh, its environment and, and the weed is included in that. Um, but, uh, but the whole thing is really applied ecology from beginning to end too. You need to understand these intricate inter, uh, interactions between a host specific in insect in this case and, and, the, and its host plant. Pre-release uh, uh, studies or host specificity studies usually fall into two categories. Uh, the no choice tests that, that basically tells you what the uh, insect or a biocontrol agent can, can feed and develop on. So this is, uh, you know, hinges on its basic physiology. Like what, what does it recognize as food and what can it digest as food as well? And uh, to the point that it can fully develop to an adult. And so uh, we figured that out, but once we've uh, f yeah, figured out what it can feed on, um, and develop on, then we do these multiple choice tests, which are more natural. And uh, they occur typically outdoors in Europe. We send them the seeds of, uh, of uh, many of our native species that are closely related to the weed, and they grow them up and, and then test them outdoors. But in that case, you're asking what, you know, what do they prefer to feed on? And so the list of species that they prefer to feed on and recognize as food can be uh, different for, you know, uh, well, not different, but it's a subset of what they can actually feed on if they're not given any choice. So, so the, the host range narrows 
typically when when you when you release them out in the wild that's because they're cluing into other things that uh, you know other uh, other environmental factors in finding their hosts as well but uh, testing is based on the degrees of relatedness of of the plants relative to the target weed and because we purposely choose insects uh, or organisms that are that are very specific to begin with, we we to save time and and also um, and and this makes sense scientifically. We tend to concentrate on plant species that are closely related to the weed because if there's going to be any non-target feeding uh, and and development, it's going to occur within those groups or groupings that are closely related to the weed that you're trying to target. So, so in, ter in terms of order of relatedness, you test things that, you know, different variants of the weed, like uh, that occur in, in the new range, like the, the proposed range for release uh, in Canada, you send seeds of those <laughs> weeds back to overseas for, the, for their testing. And uh, but then you you could look at things that are uh, in the same genus, and you know further up, uh, like there's several ge uh, genera within a tribe, there's several tribes within a family, and so several families within an order. So you keep going uh, to different circles of relatedness uh, as you move out uh, from the weed to these other groups. And then finally, you do a smattering of uh, testing, uh, usually representatives of, of uh, more distantly related to plants. Uh, we help sometimes at, uh, with our containment facility uh, doing these tests. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of my technicians. She was my graduate student uh, who is working in a, our containment facility where we keep the insects uh, under lock and key and uh and you know that haven't been approved for release yet in the environment so we uh, do these we help with the host specificity test and um and then currently we have uh a number of agents that we have in containment or, or in quarantine at lethbridge that we're learning how to work with uh, we're helping with some testing um with the group overseas but uh, we're also learning how to rear the insects and handle them uh, ahead of potential uh, approval that we would receive from CFIA to release them in the environment. And uh, yeah, that, that's a, it's really useful to have that knowledge uh, for later when, when, you know, not only do you get a pure colony that's been um, cleansed of other organisms, you know, and, and, and also, uh, we verify the identity of the organisms when we receive them from from Europe and keep them in quarantine. Um, but we get their numbers up so that when we when we are given the green light to get the agents out, we have uh, some uh, you know a colony available that can be used and um, and yeah and then just learning how to handle them. That's information we could pass to to people as well. I'm going to be introducing these uh, these agents. Two of them, the uh, top two, have been are currently uh, being petitioned for release, and the petitions are in review yet. One for Russian olive and one for oxide daisy, and then a couple of more agents. Uh, we've started colonies uh, recently in containment. One for uh, another one for oxide daisy and one for common tansy. So to just quickly introduce some of these agents. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the Russian olive golemite because I don't think Russian olive is, is a big problem in Saskatchewan, like it is um, in, you know, in um, one area of Alberta, the Medicine Hat area of Alberta, where it's a problem. And uh, we'll probably make some targeted releases if we get approval there. Uh, but, uh, but it's particularly a problem uh, this invasive tree in the lower, um, or I guess the southern interior of British Columbia and riparian areas where, where it's all competing um, native vegetation and uh, ca causing havoc with, uh, with 
yeah, we, with uh, river river systems as well. Uh, but this uh, is this is a mite. Um, one of the mites I was talking about that feed on plants. It's very host specific and it creates these galls or it really just gibbles the leaves and but it it reduces the uh, production of fruit by up to 40 percent and thereby the spread of this weed and that's the whole intent of releasing um, our proposal to release this gall, gall mite. And it, uh, what's really useful too is produces multiple generations per year. So yeah, unless you have some questions later, but uh, that's all I'm going to say about that one. But one uh, one weed that you're probably very interested in is oxide daisy, introduced to Canada in the 1800s, and uh, and yeah, it has uh, definitely spread invader or managed and native pastures. It's listed noxious in um, uh, yeah, under the, the the Federal Seeds Act because it contaminates uh, forage seed crops, which are valuable. Um, and it's very difficult uh, to separate the seeds, the small seeds of oxide daisy from, from the forage seed uh, seeds are, that are harvested. It's uh, also uh, noxious in, in uh, all Western provinces, including Saskatchewan. And it's avoided by grazing at, at cattle that find it acrid to, to the taste. And uh, its shallow roots also promotes uh, soil erosion. But uh, the oxide daisy root boring moth um, was uh, was petitioned for release just recently. But um, but it's from Europe and Asia, it's uh, it did find find it uh, already present in um, in eastern Canada, like in Ontario, I believe. Um, so it arrived somehow on its own, but we, we haven't found it in Western Canada yet. But yet uh, so that's why we're still going to go ahead and petition for its release. Yet, um, and uh, the, the main thing is that it's the larvae that feed in the root and the stems, lower stems of oxide daisy, thereby doing the damage of reducing the number, number of flowering stems and it uh, weakens the plant. Uh, and we've been successful in rearing it in, in quarantine. Uh, we also used our colony to help test uh, some of the test species that were difficult for Europe to obtain and grow for, for the host specificity testing. They did it overseas. So they asked for our help. And this little plant here is an Arctic daisy, it grows on mountaintops, uh, in this case in the Yukon. We hired someone to uh, trek up there and uh, gather some plants. Um, they grow on these uh, scree slopes, gravelly slopes, under really harsh conditions. So we managed to uh, to obtain these plants in our quarantine to do some testing. But but you know at that point where when they were collected, they uh, basically had 24 hour daylight. <laughs> Um, and uh, you know, and they get pelted with snow and rain even at that time of year. So, so we were trying to recreate some of these conditions in our growth cabinets, and, uh, and we would spray them with cold water every day, for instance. But we were successful in running a test uh, to show that these plants are safe uh, from the root moth. They weren't uh, they weren't attacked at all. But uh, the oxide daisy that we had running in this test uh, as a control definitely um, had uh, su supported uh, development to the adult stage of the moth. So the petition went in just recently, um, right before Christmas, and uh, the results were, were really good. Like uh, for the no choice tests, uh, they, the moth could develop on 11 closely related uh, species, uh, that's to oxide daisy out of the 74 that, uh, plant species that were tested. But when taken outdoors for multiple choice tests, they, they were only found on Chasta and Creeping Daisy, which, which are, they're, they're, not from, they're not native to Canada, but they're, they're valuable ornamentals. So we, they did extra testing, a lot of extra testing to see if this uh, development of the insect on these plants matter, and uh, it was found that the that the, even though uh, you know there's uh, 
and you know occasional feeding and development on these plants far less than on oxide daisy uh, but it, it, it did not do any damage uh, uh, to the chassis daisy especially uh, creeping daisy isn't a, a very common uh, ornamental so we, we focused on the chasta daisy. Uh, now the other agent that we have in, that we're rearing right now is uh, is this uh, root, root galling fly, um, and uh, yeah, these are pretty little flies actually with the markings on the on the wings. But they form these galls on the roots of uh, outside daisy, and um, yeah, we've been successful in rearing these as well, thanks to my technician, uh, Tamara Messer, who uh, who learned, uh, she went overseas for a summer in 2018 to learn how to handle these insects too. So, but, uh, so far the uh, fly and the testing has, has uh, shown to be very host specific, so it looks promising. The other weed is the uh, common tansy. Um, that we're looking at. And of course, that's a problem in Saskatchewan as well, uh, where it's listed as noxious. It's, uh, yeah, it's aromatic, uh, rather a uh, muscular plant. And it, it occurs in all provinces and territories except none of it in Canada. So it's very uh, able to uh, invade a number of habitats, but especially native and managed pastures where it's uh, a problem, it's toxic to humans and livestock, which is a real problem to, uh, in terms of the agriculture, and it occurs in riparian habitats as well. But, um, but we received just recently, this was uh, again right before Christmas, we, re we, we received this uh, stem boring weevil that occurs in, in Europe, um, yeah, especially uh, Eastern Europe. But, uh, but we received it from uh, Russia and uh, don't know if we'll be able to get uh, more anytime soon, but uh, we're hoping we can start a colony with this insect. Um, it can be, it looks like it could be really effective because it's damaging to, to the plants uh, reproduction. It, it uh, burrows into the uh, flowering stems and um, and yeah, we'll see what happens. Like I, you know, no promises because I think it's a very difficult agent to work with as well. It does, it doesn't, it's not easily reared, and it didn't even like be like traveling. Uh, we find they finally found out that overseas that best time to ship them is in the fall rather than trying to ship them in the spring when they die uh, very quickly uh, in shipment. So lastly, I just want to quickly talk about, um, yeah, the you know the final stages of getting an agent ramped up for uh, for use um, and and in the hands of people that need them. So um, yeah, so after yeah, this is after uh, we figure out that the agent is successfully establishing and having impact. Uh, so we want to develop some uh, really strategies for people as well and, and de develop methods of mass rearing and distributing the agent. So uh, use as an example, uh, the work we've been doing with Rhinusa pilosa. This is an agent uh, that we've been releasing in Saskatchewan. You'll see how well it establishes on the prairie. Uh, but it was introduced from Serbia. Um, first releases were made in 2014. It's very host specific. It doesn't feed even on closely related toad flax species, but it has a pretty good impact. Um, and uh, based on you know our, our research, and but the adults they emerge in the spring. They lay their eggs in the shoot tips, and uh, as a you know, and then this big fleshy gall is formed on the stems that sucks all the nutrients and water and, um, and things that, that go to normal uh, growth and reproduction of the plant are channeled to, to these larvae that feed within the gall. And uh, you can see there's a larva at the top of the last uh, photograph to the right. Um, and then they pupate in the gall uh, towards the end, end of summer. They emerge as adults and continue to feed inside the gall before they uh, 
uh, chew a hole on the side of the gall to emerge to overwinter in the litter and soil. But uh, the first releases were made uh, in 2014-16 across Canada, including Saskatchewan. And um, you know we've we've been monitoring these to see what kind of establishment is occurring and uh, how the populations are behaving. You know, are they increasing, de decreasing, or disappearing, disappearing altogether, or there never was any establishment? So it's kind of a mixed bag. But we we do seem that like there seems to be some pattern patterns emerging. This is just for the Western Canadian releases. But anything in yellow means that uh, there's they're there and they're increasing in number. Anything in red, uh, if it's a hollow red uh, ring, it uh, means that they they're absent. They didn't establish. Uh, but a solid red means they're there, but they're decreasing in number. So we want we haven't uh, monitored since 2019. So we're anxious now that things are opening up a bit more post pandemic, uh, or, or yeah, or this stage of the pandemic that we can get out and re uh, monitor these sites to see what's actually happening. But, um, but their uh, star, like any of the yellow stars, those are the best sites where they're really increasing uh, you know, uh, four or five, five-fold uh, uh, increase of, of the insects at these sites. But these tend to be at higher elevations, and especially around the Calgary area. And there's one site uh, in the Alfred area of south, southeastern uh, BC that's doing quite well at high elevation. So, we're, you know, I'm not sure what's going on, but we think that moisture level might be involved. Uh, I'll point out those are two releases in Saskatchewan are, are at Last Mountain Lake, but we've made many others in the Saskatoon and Battleford area, and uh, and I'm hoping to get more out. Uh, we made some at uh, Prince Albert National Park too, but we need to find out maybe they're going to do better, you know, in more boreal areas too. So so uh, this is all part of the learning process and. Uh, to kind of test the idea that moisture, soil moisture might be important, that allows the gall, the gall that is formed to really get big and juicy uh, and draw the nutrients to the larvae. Uh, what we want to find out is uh, if, if moisture level matters. So we're running these experiments, like this one is in the greenhouse where we have automated watering um, being delivered at different levels in this case, two different levels uh, to, to these potted uh, toflax plants. Then we cage the insects on them and see what happens. We're also looking at two genetic strains of the, of the toflax weevil, Rhinus apilosa, to see, see if um, genetics matter too. Some might be more hardy to uh, low, low moisture situations. And uh, yeah, so now that we have some beginning information, we know where the insect is doing best. Um, you know, the whole idea is to get, uh, to get, you know, get the insect ramped up in number and develop uh, methods of mass rearing. We can rear in the lab, um, and that's where the first uh, material for the first releases have has come from. Um, you know, again, we have these. Uh, these potted plants that we overwinter pot and all in our cooler and we bring them out in the spring. We know what stage of development to grow the plants up to before caging them with the insects. But you can see the harvest of galls down here in the lower left hand side. Like we, we produce like thousands um, in rearing in the lab. Um, yeah, this is just an, uh, the cage plants is to give you an idea how we cage the, the insects on. Uh, this was work we did in 2020 because we, we were kind of restricted uh, in terms of, of our presence at the research center. So we were all rearing in our backyards. And in, in, in this case, I, was, I had a production line going in the kitchen. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, you know, that's one method. But you know, we're a research facility. We're not an ma insect mass production facility. And uh, there's got to be better ways of doing this because this is a very expensive method. 
Um, just to give you an example for the houndstongue weevil, we developed the method of farming the weevil during the early days of distributing this agent. We grew houndstongue like a crop <laughs> in, uh, on prime farmland in, in, um, in Creston, BC, in southern BC. And, uh, and then we seeded the insects into the crop, propagated it up to high numbers, and then, and, uh, you know, within two generations, it produced thousands of weevils that we sucked up with vacuum cleaners and uh, separated it out in, using a natural method, like we threw all the, you know, the leaf litter and everything with the weevils into these carver boxes and that let them sort themselves by crawling towards a, a hole uh, in the box with a, uh, with a trap bag and they just crawl towards the light on their own and that's how we sorted them. But you know, but this is very specific to this insect. So each insect is gonna ha have, um, you know, because of their biology and the need, uh, all we needed to do is get the insect going in this case and get them out real quick. So this was a one shot sort of mass rearing thing that happened early in the program. And once they got out there on their own, they didn't, you know, didn't have to release them at all because they were finding hound's tongue on their own. Um, but what I'm proposing to do is to set up some natural nursery sites uh, for Rhinosa pilosa for the yellow toe flax. So find some nice dense patches in the prime locations where the insect seems to be increasing and doing well and letting it rip for a few years, you know, until the numbers get up high. And then we just recently too, we've done some experiments to show that you can release them uh, either in the spring or in the fall. But the best way, I think, you don't want to be handling these insects in the spring because they don't live very well uh, or they're bothered by that. So the best thing to do is, uh, is just go out in late summer when the galls are there and the adults have already released in their or already have uh, merged inside their galls and are feeding. So crack open a few galls if the adults are there, then collect a bunch of galls and move them to a new site. So, you know, that's the sort of thing that our research can tell, can tell people, uh, you know, inform them on how to handle and, uh, and use the insect down the road. So that's about it. Uh, yeah, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And I think jo Joanne's gonna come on now to talk to you. Yeah, I just wanna say thank you to all those people <laughs> that have helped in our program. All right, hi everyone. Can you see my screen, Rose? Yes, I can. Perfect. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to go over really quickly our biocontrol program in Saskatchewan that the PHOs currently coordinate. Um, just in case you're wondering where you can access biocontrols in the province. So uh, biocontrol is coordinated by the plant health officers in Saskatchewan and we're in charge of biocontrol agent collection, release and monitoring within the province. Um, so one of our biggest ways to access biocontrols is our leafy spurge beetle collection days at the sand campground every July. And for other biocontrol agents, uh, you can feel free to reach out to your division plant health officer. We have the historical release and monitoring data for most biocontrol agents in the province, and we can help you pick a suitable site for release. So just to, uh, Rose kind of touched on the leafy spurge beetles, they're Apsona species, and we have a collection day that's free for all Saskatchewan landowners, RNs, and First Nation bands to come collect leafy spurge beetles for release on their property. And the PHOs are present during these collection days to provide information and assist in packaging the beetles. And we do provide sweep nets as well, so you don't have to have your own, you just come out and borrow one. They take place every July, and it's usually the first week of July, but it all depends on beetle emergence and weather. 
if you'd like to be on my email list for the collection days, just send me an email and I'll add you to my, my list to let you know when the collection days are going to take place this year. Um, and then we have a few other agents in the province. This is kind of our more retro agents is the scentless chamomile seed weevil. So they consume the seeds on the flower head. And then we also have the scentless chamomile gall midge, and they lay eggs and create galls on the growing points of the scentless chamomile. And this disrupts the growth and reduces flowering. So that's another agent that we have the historical uh, collection and monitoring data on. So if you're interested in scentless chamomile biocontrol agents, we can help you up with that as well. Um, and as Rose mentioned, we do have the stem galling toad flax weevil. Uh, Colleen Fennig, our Division 6 plant health officer, is currently working on establishing some populations in northwest Saskatchewan. And uh, Rose also mentioned that we did our first Saskatchewan release of the hound's tongue root weevil in 2020. And it did establish, we checked it last summer, and we Good. found evidence of the feeding and of the, the weevils themselves. So excited to go out this summer and see how they're doing in their, their second year. Um, and another thing I just wanted to touch on real quickly was when you're considering a biocontrol release, just to ensure that you have a suitable site. Um, so our guidelines are generally uh, to have a noxious weed infestation of more than 12 acres per quarter section of land. And you may need to still contain that perimeter uh, using herbicide if needed. And uh, also if we have weeds present in areas where herbicide application is not possible, such as an environmentally sensitive area. And this is all of the plant health officers contact information. If you have any questions about biocontrols, feel free to reach out or type it into the box here. And so we do have a couple questions. Hmm. Okay, what would a person need if they wanted to be the person that collected native plants for testing? Are these typically AAFC employees or contracted employees? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. I get. I guess it depends. Uh, yeah. Like we'll we'll take plants from anyone. I mean, like, uh, but they. But it'd be helpful if they uh, they had good um, plant ID skills, and uh, like we like BC for instance. They like they've been big supporters of our program, and and they've uh, in the case of the the Arctic Daisy I showed you for testing the oxide daisy agents. Uh, they hired a, a retired botanist uh, to, to to do the collection, but you know it's a matter of just getting in touch with um, I guess the scientists like ourselves that are working on the projects, because then then we can advise as to how best to get the plant material and what you know. Sometimes um, they can't be easily grown from seed, or it's very difficult. So like with the Arctic daisy, they had to be collected the whole plants had to be collected and that's why it was impossible to get them uh, to Europe so that they they were still living it when they re received them and that's why we intervened um, but we're always looking like uh, overseas they're always looking for plant material for the test test lists that are um, developed and there's a yeah there's a lot done um, in terms of developing those lists as well. So yeah, just contact me, I guess, <laughs> depending on the weed, uh, the weed system. Fantastic. Um, and then the next question was, are the toad flax weevils available to producers or uh, only through other avenues? Uh, well, like they, I consider them still uh, in the experimental stage, but we're coming, you know, like I said, we're coming to a point where we're getting a better feel for where they're establishing. And I, you know, I hope to actually uh, run a run an experiment or study to look at their actual impact in the field at one of these sites where they're doing well. Um, so once we get past this, like I think within the next five years, we're looking at more general distribution, especially if we get um, these nursery sites up and running. Then then they just get handed off to you know municipalities and um, 
in the provinces that that uh, have a system of getting them out to to stakeholders that want them, like land managers and farmers and yeah. So it's uh, the development of the, those sort of uh, avenues is really insect by insect as well. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the next question is, Rose stated that leafy spurge would be far worse today if it didn't have beetles. Um, could you clarify or quantify this statement? Does oh. it apply to, to small oh, areas or the province as a whole? Yeah, I don't have any data. Like this is kind of just looking at the situation, you know, but yeah, yeah, you have to look at how the, how the environment is changing over time too, you know, like with like with, with uh, climatic warming and that too, who, like I can't say for sure, but the fact that you have something out there that is actually reducing the plant's numbers and populations, uh, you know, like I think the next step is to say, well, there's, there's got to be, it's got to be better than if you didn't have anything feeding on that, that weed, right? So, like, I, I, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm, it's not very good for a scientist to guess, but, <laughs> yeah, I'm just surmising that that's yeah. the case. Mm -hmm. Good question, though. Yeah. Gotta Wonderful. hold my feet to the fire. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I don't see any more questions, so we can probably wrap things up. Thank you so much, Rose, for coming yeah. and talking on the webinar. I know it's really valuable information for myself and the other attendees. And uh, thank you to everybody who tuned in. Um, I'm sure we'll be continuing these webinars into next winter as well. So thank you so much. Yeah, I, I just want to give a shout out to Colleen. Uh, Fennec, who's who really ha has been helping helping get the um, experimental releases of Rhinusa pilosa out in Saskatchewan, and uh, I'm hoping I can meet all of you at some point too, you know, during a, a field day. So yes, yeah. that would be wonderful. Yeah, and go riders. <laughs> <laughs> my, my husband's from Saskatchewan, so I'm a rider fan too. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you and take care, everyone. Bye.